Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome into another episode of the Odds and Audibles podcast. If you're wondering why this doesn't sound like Matt Prem or Eric Scopel, it's because it's not. This is Jared Mack, your host today. I'm here and I'm joined by Dylan Conway and Jackson Noggle, our two fantastic interns. And we are here to talk about why the transfer portal and the NIL rules are ruining college football. Um, no, we're actually not. <laughs> we're here to discuss Oregon Diamond sports. Yes, you heard that right. This is uh, probably maybe for the first time. Uh, we'll talk with uh, producer Eric Scopel later today if this is the first time we've had a strictly Diamond Sports Duck Territory podcast, but it's going to happen today. Uh, first up to bat, we're going to start talking about softball. So Dylan, Jackson, um, how about both you guys? Let's have a quick little introduction here. Dylan, go right ahead and uh, Jackson, go right after. I'm Dylan Conway. This is a, my first or second month with uh, Duck Territory. Uh, really enjoying it. I'm a senior at, uh, at Oregon with a journalism major and uh, looking forward to talk some softball. Uh, same here, you know, a couple months into uh, helping you guys out at Duck Territory, also senior at the U of O studying journalism. And uh, yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Super excited to be uh, getting involved with the uh, podcast, especially. We are super excited to have you both on. Uh, for all, all of our listeners who have a Twitter, Dylan's Twitter is at dconway underscore three. Make sure you give him a follow. And Jackson Noggle is at sports huge. That's E-U-G. Uh, make sure to give him a follow as well. They'll be providing content from Duck Territory. Um, but yeah, let's get it cracking. Just um, either one of you guys, uh, Jackson, let's start with you. Just your your perspective from the team and, and how the last uh, last two weeks have gone. Yeah, you know, overall, the last two weeks have been a bumpy road for the softball team. Um, pretty much since me and Dylan got brought aboard here with Duck Territory, <laughs> they've been, they, they hit a rough patch. Um, it started with a series win over Cal, but since then – swept by UCLA, swept by Arizona State, dropped a series to Arizona, and then was swept by Washington. Uh, as of late, late, though, they've gotten a little bit hotter, just coming off a series three-game sweep over uh, the Beavers. So they kind of did a full 180 here lately. I don't know how you're feeling, Dylan, but I think it's been a completely different ball club this last week. Um, they came out and played really good against the Beavs, found some bullpen pitching that they haven't had the last couple weeks, and uh, were really able to pick up what was a super pivotal series win um, when they needed it most. So overall, not ideal, but I think they're finding their footing right when they need to here late. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, I feel bad because I feel like we've been bad luck ever since joining. They've been on you know, a really cold streak. <laughs> but then again, that's also because they've been playing some of the best teams in the conference and in the whole nation. So that's also part of it. Um, like you said, huge series win last week against Oregon State. You know, swept them. That was really big. Before that, you know, really cold against Pac-12, um, Pac-12 competition. And as the season ends, you know, we have one more uh, conference series against Stanford coming up this weekend. But as a series, um, as the season ends and we're going into uh, regionals, um, it's a little worrisome because, you know, you play teams like Washington, uh, Arizona State, UCLA, who are all, you know, ranked in the top 15. You know, these are the kind of teams that you're going to play in regionals. So, it's really good experience to play those kind of, kind of teams um, in the regular season and for your commerce to be so good. That's helpful for, you know, regionals. Um, but this next series is also really important. Like every win is crucial from here on out. I think you so, hit it on the head, man. And uh, something to add, like you touched on it real briefly. Um, Pac-12 is so tough in softball. It's hard to even put it into words. The Ducks right now, last I saw a post on Twitter, number one in the na uh, nation, excuse me, in strength of schedule. So um, that really puts into perspective the type of competition they're playing. Um, like you said, those are all postseason teams. And I think it, uh, despite not getting the results they wanted, it was good to get those experiences against those postseason teams. And uh, we'll see if they can turn it around here as we head into that postseason. That's true. It, it is a fine line too, you know, because it's easy to say that you're playing these, you're playing these hard teams. It's good for experience going into regionals, but then again, they haven't won any games against those top three or four teams. Um, and that's a little worrisome. You, you, I would want to see at least one or two um, wins against those teams just to know that they can do it. And a lot of those wins, especially against UW, both two of those games, they need, they didn't even get a run against. So I agree that it's good to get these, those kind of experiences against top teams like that. 
but also when they're, when they're getting no wins and um, only beating teams like PSU uh, five to two, it's a little worrisome. But then again, they show that they're able to, you know, get back on the right track with a sweep last week. And hopefully they can keep that going into regionals. Just from your guys' perspective, you've mentioned the sweep, and we'll, we'll get into the postseason chat in, in a little bit, but what do you think has had changed in, in the week from you know, dropping a few games to coming out and, and playing and, and getting the sweep last week? What do, you get, what do you think has changed mostly? What I saw was the bullpen pitching. I briefly mentioned it. Um, in the series that I watched uh, leading up to the Oregon State series, uh, it seemed like Stevie Hansen was kind of alone out there on the circle um, in terms of uh, providing good stuff over the plate. Um, every time McKenna Klee Thermos, Jordan Dale, uh, Reagan Breedlove, every time we had to dig into our bullpen, it got a little bit um, a little bit dangerous there. Um, gave up some big runs, a lot of home runs. But against Oregon State, Klee Thermos really came to play. She had an 11 strikeout game in game two. Um, and picked up two wins, I think, in that series. So she really showed us that we have more than one arm on this team and can really pitch, you know, into the sixth, seventh inning. So I think that's going to make a difference, and it did make a difference against Oregon State. Hopefully she can keep that uh, momentum going forward. Um, yeah, like I said, Clithermis did not have her best stuff when we started covering the team, but it's slowly picked up as the season has gone on. I agree. I mean, you know, Stevie Hansen, she's a freshman, and we are relying on her heavy, especially in – the Arizona State Arizona series, and um, against Portland State, she had I think twelve strikeouts, which was you know a career best, and she was you know having a great year as a freshman. And then we stick her out against Washington, number eleven team in the nation, and then um, doesn't have her best games, and that shows to you know she's getting played all the time as a freshman. She's playing against top ten teams constantly, and to have the thermos step up and they, they also, you know, you mentioned her 11 strikeout game and also the last game against Oregon state where they won four two, they kind of tag team that game. They, they both played a good amount of innings and if they can keep that up, that's really important because just relying on a freshman uh, to get wins against these highly ranked teams, you know, that's a lot, a lot of pressure on her, a lot of pressure on the batters. Um, so if they can keep that going, I agree. That was the biggest showing and biggest difference into what got them their wins this weekend. So I kind of see this team from afar. I'm focused more on baseball. But it does seem from an outsider's perspective that the offense has kind of been subpar for, for the low points, at least during the season, which, you know, a little unfair because when, when you aren't scoring, you're not usually winning. But mm -hmm. do you guys think as a whole the offense has been uh, a little – just not not as not as potent as it has been in the past in your in your perspective. Yeah, I mean it's weird because I don't have the stats in front of me, but they're at, in, during the Washington series they were still a highly ranked uh, batting team. They were in the top ten, top fifteen in batting average, which was kind of surprising seeing that they were struggling as of late. But they have that ability to be that you know high powered um, batting team, and you know this this is the same for all diamond sports, but. It seems to me that they're, you know, really streaky. If they get on a run, they can, you know, have an extreme amount of hits. And then again, they got struck out or they'd get a run in two games against Washington. So it could really go either way. They can be streaky like that. But then again, they, they're still they're still highly ranked in batting average, which might be surprising looking at their last few weeks. But um then again, like if they can get that going into the inter regionals, that could change the whole game. And I think somebody that kind of epitomizes that streakiness is Ari Carlson, Ariel Carlson. Um, last year, she wasn't the biggest hitter. This year, she comes out. She leads the team in home runs. Um, she's among the leaders in the Pac-12. But like you said, she's very streaky. She also leads the team in strikeouts. Um, so I think it's going to come down to can we get that home, home run hitting Carlson versus that striking out Carlson? Can we get uh, those good streaks going at the right times here? Because we've seen it. Um, they've put up a bunch of runs in some games and some games have gone completely scoreless. So yeah, we're just, we're hoping for that uh, good side of the bat. Yeah. And, and along those lines, um, it seems to be, you know, one player, you know, randomly having a, a good game. One of the, 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 I believe it was the last game of the series against Utah where they didn't score a run. I think two of the three hits were from Hannah Delgado and she had a really good game, but none of the, none of the other bats were getting going. So it's gotta be, when everyone's clicking, it goes well. I know that's cliche, but 
everyone's got to be on the right side of it. And if just one player is getting home runs or getting hits, it's not going to work out. Um, so, yeah, I agree. It's, it's all about the streakiness. And if they can fix that, they can be really, really, they, they can be dangerous, like whatever. It's just about you really just don't know where, you, where you're getting sometimes. So we're going to kind of position here for, for postseason talk. Um, Oregon had Stanford for three games this weekend. Stanford is 32 and 16 and 8 and 10 in conference. So it's better in both than Oregon is. Just how, how do you guys feel about the program as it's the last week of the season, as it heads into the, the Pac-12 tournament, as it heads into postseason play? Just, I guess, I guess, a confidence rating from you guys, if you have one, just like about their their ability to, you know, maybe make a, sec, like a, a second weekend into the tournament, at, at maybe not an endgame guy, but – uh, just their ability to make some 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 sort of push into the postseason. I think that they've put themselves in a pretty good spot here. Um, the Stanford series is going to be super pivotal because we're coming off of a sweep. In order to add a sweep to that, that would be huge, especially after you know the Ducks were swept in the last two series um, they played. Um, and yeah, like I said, it seems like it's been sort of a full one hundred and eighty on that Oregon State series. Um, you can kind of get the sense from Coach Lombardi that they have a lot of confidence going in the uh, dugout these days. Um, they really rolled with those punches. And to see them come out and sweep that series is actually really impressive. Um, one to ten rating, I'd give them a seven and a half right now. Even though they've been so rough the last couple, last couple of weeks, I think they've really been able to bring their play around in, in this last Oregon State series. And if they can keep that going against Stanford, I, I think they're going to be dangerous in the postseason for sure. Like Dylan said, um, random batters can have big games, and I think that's a that's a that's a positive to this Oregon team. Um, we can see a, a Rachel Sid step up and making a clutch RBI. Uh, KK Humphreys, you know, the the roster is deep and it's streaky, but it's deep, and I think that's going to come up huge. Um, and Stanford series is going to be the most pivotal of the season so far because it's going to decide if we're really going into the postseason on this sort of rough patch or if we're going to ended on a six game win streak. There's a big difference there. Yeah, I'm with you. And for me, it's hard to get too, um, too high on the, on the, the team after this one series, even though it's great, we got the sweep. Um, but this next series, I feel like every series for the past month or two, it's been really unknown what they're going to look like going into. And I think it all stems from the first game. The players talk about it all the time. The first game sets the tone for the whole series. And if you look at the past few series over the, past few months it's telling the first game really kind of sets the tone and the rest of the series plays out because of the tone of the, of the first game so i think we're really going to know more after the first game just you know off how they look um but i'm with you you know seven and a half eight i mean they are a good team they have the pieces we've been saying this the whole time um it's just a matter of what they're going to look like and you know it's going to be tough the records are around the same stanford's a little better but uh if they can win this series going into regionals, you know, I'll be a lot more confident because, you know, that'll be against tougher teams. And with that experience they've had against tougher teams over the course of the season, you know, who knows? You Another both- point to that, they've also struggled on the road a lot this year. Um, oh. The last true road test was at Arizona, I believe, lost that series, a series that a lot of Duck fans thought they would be able to pull out. Um, and, He's yeah, if I can check too. here, generally speaking, yeah – uh, I guess they're <laughs> on the season. They haven't struggled too much on the road. They're twelve and seven, but of late here, they haven't done as well on the, on the road as they have at home. So that's why a Stanford series is going to make a difference. They were able to sweep the Beavs at home. Can they travel and get the win at Stanford? That's going to be telling as far as the postseason goes as well. Because right now the Ducks aren't in a great spot to be hosting games in the postseason. So we would love to see how they can travel. And one one quick thing too is, I mean, this is kind of unrelated, but. After a few of those series, it looked really, it looked pretty bleak. I mean, hearing Lombardi talk, it looked pretty bleak in terms of, you know, the hope for uh, being successful in regionals and hosting and things like that. And in some of those, you know, press conferences, you felt a vibe where it really wasn't that, like, even though what they were saying, um, it didn't feel like they believed it sometimes. But then again, the whole Pac-12 is so tight. And it's really, it is true that no matter how many games you lose, you're still in it because, it's a bloodbath. Everyone's beating everybody. 
Yeah, that's what's awesome about us being beat writers is we get a taste of the morale. We get a taste of, you know, the emotion from the players and the and the coaches. Sorry, Jared, for buttoning. No, you're good. You're um, good. I appreciate the passion. Yeah, we got we we really get a taste of what the players and coaches are feeling like post game. And like Dylan said, (laughs) for a couple of weeks there was pretty bleak. I was nervous to ask questions because, you know, we're losing games, but um, it has completely turned around. And uh, speaking to that full 180 again, I think the Oregon State series was huge. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in real quick. You you guys both mentioned how the pieces are there for this potentially to make a run. Um, I guess this is a similar question to what I just asked, but um, now after that that sweep of Oregon State, where it seemed like some of the pieces come together, like is your confidence there that this team can continue to ride that, or is it something that you know this is like a three game nice blip where they win three games in a row after losing it was six in a row something like that? Like, are you guys confident that they can? they can have those pieces click again for another uh, two, three weekends, or is that just something that might only happen once a, once a week? Well, honestly, my confidence isn't fully there until I see them do, until I see them have a good series against another team, because who knows, maybe Oregon state was just a good matchup for them. I, yeah, it's, it's hard to really, I mean, after five, like four or five losing series in a row, I need to see more than one series, more than one winning series for me to really get confident about the team. Even though I know they have the pieces, I know they can get it done. It's just a matter of I need to see it before I can really, um, you know, be confident about this team going into regionals. Because another thing that's scary is that, you know, two of their other losses this year are to um, a ranked Northwestern and a ranked Missouri. And those are their other, those are their only two other, um, ranked non-conference um, games they played. So I need to see them in action in Stanford for me to really make an assessment on how I feel about them uh, in the next few weeks. Totally agree. It's all about consistency, man. Um, we we have many, many batters that can step up and uh, make a difference in a game. Um, like I said, Sid has made clutch RBIs, Humphreys, and even into the outfielders, everybody. Um, has stood up at one point or another. And it's just about doing that consistently. Um, We haven't really seen it in the time that we've been covering the team. But if we look at the early season, this team played great in the non-conference schedule, uh, beat some good teams. They won a series against Baylor. Um, So, yeah, we kind of need to see that consistency a little bit more here against the conference foes. And then, obviously, it's going to be important in the postseason. We need more of those batters stepping up. You guys mentioned earlier, like, how the, the, the Pac-12 is, you know, it's a dogfight basically every weekend with teams like Arizona State and UCLA and Washington. Um, is there, going into the tournament, is there a team that you guys, maybe other than like Arizona State and UCLA, because they are really, really good to everybody across the country, is there a team that you'd rather just not have Oregon play in, in the Pac-12 tournament? Just one that's like, ah, that's a bad matchup. That's a tough yeah. one. I mean, even though I mean it's easy to say a team like Washington because they're number eleven, even though they're third in the Pac-12, they're ranked number eleven. But I mean, for me especially, that, because even against UCLA, they were in every game. They lost three to one, five to two, and four to two. And I watched every game, and both every game they could have won. Two of the games against Washington, they were ran out of their own building, and it wasn't even close. They lost. Uh, the first game was 9-0, and they had one hit, and it just it, – the whole game, it just, you, there was no feeling of hope to win that game. Uh, even though they lost a close one in game two, um, going against the pitcher, I forget her name, blanking on it, but they couldn't get, they couldn't get anything going against her. Um, and uh, being there and seeing it in action, it really makes me not want to go against UW. Something I always say about – Prompts like this, those beating the same team twice is difficult. Obviously, in uh, diamond sports, it's a lot more times because you got series. But um, mm-hmm. I think I think these these ducks are going to be eager to get out there against uh, U- UW, UCLA, some of the teams that they got embarrassed by, maybe not embarrassed, but beaten. Because um, you know they lost the, to each of these teams three times, and like you said, against Washington, it was it was handily oh uh, nine and oh five in <laughs> two of those games. So I think, like I said, they're going to be eager to flip that around and bounce back. And dealing with the Ducks two, in two different series is going to be difficult. Uh, and 
it's tough to go against UCLA and Washington because those are the two, two top teams, but I, I kind of want to see those teams. I want to see us bounce back against them and get a, a victory. To turn it around, I want UCLA. To kind of like emphasize on what I just said, I, I want them. I, I watched every game. We were in every game. It was really close. They're third in the nation, but I don't know what it is. Maybe it was matchups. Maybe we just played well that weekend, but it was in L.A., and each game was a nail-biter. It was a close game every game. They have – a few of the best pitchers in the nation, and I and we, we could have won any of those games. So if there's a team that we have to play that's highly ranked in the Pac-12, I think it should be them. I, I think we should want to face them because I think a win is very foreseeable playing UCLA. All right, guys, before before we send you off, just uh, give me each uh, one of the highlights that you guys have had covering the team um, at home, like being, being a full-time beat writer for us. Well, for, I mean, it's been a lot of losses, I'll be honest. But the one, the one that really stands out, the one that really stands out to me is uh, the game against uh, Portland State. Um, it was a Wednesday night game, five two. Not a lot of people in the building, but um, Stevie Hansen uh, got twelve strikeouts, and she was great at the press conference afterwards. She didn't even know she had the record, so her it was a pretty um, comedic press conference, and it was just cool to see her, you know, just tear it up that game. For me, it was uh, McKenna Thermos's story. Like I said, she was rolling with some punches in those tough series that we watched, um, having some real struggles on the circle. And then to see her come out against Oregon State and um, honestly pitch better than Hanson for the first series uh, this season that I've seen um, was really impressive. And just I thought a really good story, uh, sort of a rags to riches story <laughs> of her struggling uh, a couple weeks ago and then turning it completely around and kind of dominating the Beavers. I mean, 11 strikeouts on Saturday was ridiculous. And then she closed the door on them on Sunday with a couple great escapes and some tough innings. So, yeah, I think not only going forward is Cleothermia going to be an X factor, but I think her story this year was the one that stood out to me the most. Well, guys, I appreciate you you coming on and, and enlightening all us about about softball here. Uh, again, a reminder for those listening or those watching, uh, Dylan Conway and Jackson Noggle. You could follow Dylan on Twitter at Dil, or at d conway underscore three, and Jackson you could follow at sports huge. That's e u g almost Eugene. So thank you guys again, and uh, appreciate the softball coverage. Uh, softball has a three game series starting Friday at five p.m. I'm sure these guys are going to be on it. You'll be seeing more of their content at duckterritory.com in the, in the upcoming days. So thanks again, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much, Jerry. Appreciate it, man. Mm-hmm. Well, before we move on to baseball, we are going to take a quick break. And uh, thank you all for listening again. So we are back here on the Odds and Audibles podcast. And if you're still listening after – maybe not wanting to listen to too many diamond sports. You're listening to Jared Mack talk about Oregon's baseball team. Uh, They are fresh off a Tuesday night loss to Oregon state two to nothing. Um, If you're here watching with us, you get to see my ugly mug. If you're listening to us, then you get to listen to me, but I'm going to take basically the same approach as we did with, with Jackson and Dylan as the previous podcast and kind of give a state of the program, a temperature check, I would say, um, Last two weeks have not been very good with uh, Oregon baseball. Uh, They've had four losses, uh, two to Washington State, and then two to Oregon State with a, or excuse me, they've had five losses in the last two weeks, including a loss to Cal where they they took two or three but lost a Sunday matchup. Um, We'll we'll start with the Oregon State game because it's still fresh on my mind from last night. Uh, It's a two to nothing loss. Oregon only allowed four hits total to Oregon State one of them being a solo shot in the uh, the eighth inning, excuse me, the seventh inning for Justin Boyd, who has become an unbelievable thorn in the side of Oregon baseball. The week prior, he also hit a two-run home run and robbed a two-run home run from Jack Scanlon. So he's somebody that I, I think Oregon would be okay if he were not in the lineup coming this Friday, but he'll be there because he's one of Oregon State's best players. So the state of the program is this. Oregon has a chance to host a regional for the second year in a row. If I were to tell you that a couple of years ago, I think most people would be surprised or a ask if Oregon actually had a baseball team because well, they didn't for a long time. And now they're kind of turning a corner with head coach, Mark Wazikowski. Um, 
funny enough, they were shut out on Tuesday, two to nothing for the first time under the under Mark Wazikowski. Um, it was since April of 2019 was the last time they were shut out. So Wazikowski is doing exactly what he intended to do. He's making this a fun baseball program. There are a lot of home runs, a lot of extra base hits, a lot of power arms. It's just fun baseball to watch, go to the stands for me to cover for anybody at all. But moving on, the the program is capable of, of hosting a regional here this season at Eugene, which would start on June 3rd. Uh, D1Baseball.com, which is the, I would say, the go-to website for college baseball news and uh, college baseball rankings, things like that. They did a projected field of 64, and Oregon was the 13th seed. So the top 16 teams uh, in the country host a regional. The top eight teams host a super regional. So for those unfamiliar, a regional moves into a super regional. So each, each of these regionals, all 16 of them, have four teams in there. Oregon is currently selected to host a regional right now, as a projected, excuse me, with UNLV, uh, Vanderbilt, and UC Santa Barbara. So that, is, yeah, that was quite the, the draw by Oregon if that actually happens. But that's where Oregon stands today. They're 22nd in RPI, excuse me, 23rd in RPI, down from 18th uh, a week ago. They've been as high as fourth in the country in RPI. Um, the last two and a half, three weeks have been quite telling of where this program is. There have been a lot of, um, a lot of late losses. Um, Washington State, in particular, they had a, a furious comeback against Oregon on the weekend of the spring game on Sunday. Um, that was a tough loss for Oregon. Um, they played Oregon State, the number two team in the country, who's also in line to host a regional and should host a super regional eventually. Um, they, they, I mean, they're the number two team in the country for a reason. Um, they're 35 and nine now. Uh, they just beat Oregon on Tuesday night. They're a very good program. And for as, you know, as, as much as I'm sure some of the listeners don't like to hear talking about how good a Beaver program is, this is the one to talk about. Um, but Oregon has played them very well. Uh, a four to two and a two to nothing loss is nothing to nothing to be upset about. Uh, head coach or Mark Wazikowski, he, after both games, uh, talked to the media and talked to us and mentioned about how, how good of a baseball game that was. Um, the problem is, is losing to teams like Washington State and Cal, where these are teams that Oregon should sweep. I know they won the series against Cal two to three, or excuse me, two of the three games, but losing a series to Washington State as they did two weeks ago, you know, that's not a great sign. Um, the Cal loss was, uh, I, I could see it being a backbreaker on the season. Um, in the top of the eighth inning, there was, Bases loaded two outs, a fly ball to right field, which Anthony Hall overran, ball dropped. That was inside the park, grand slam. Later changed to an error, which I have some problems with, but it was still a grand slam, so Oregon ended up losing. So you turn that and you lose on Tuesday to Oregon State, and now you have three games in Corvallis at Goss in front of a ruckus Oregon State crowd. This will be a very decisive weekend for the state of the program if if Oregon is to win two of three, it's monumental. It's basically Oregon would really have to mess their way up to not host a regional. If they lose all three, well, then there's a thin line between hosting a regional and being shipped across the country. Um, I think UCLA, who is who is uh, number two in the Pac-12 standings right now behind Oregon State, they're going to South Bend. They're going to Notre Dame's regional in, this, in the most recent projections. So that's the type of issue that could come with Oregon not hosting a regional as they're going to be shipped out across the country and suddenly they aren't playing in front of their home fans. They're not sleeping in their own beds. It makes it a lot harder to win those baseball games, but that's why you reward those people who are the top 16 teams and hold and hosting a regional. So again, it goes back to this, this weekend in Oregon state, this three game series, it starts with RJ Gordon going against Cooper Jerpy for Oregon state. Uh, Jerpy is one of the best pitchers in the country, flat out. He has over 100 strikeouts in less than 70 innings. Um, he's an absolute force. And this brings us to the biggest problem with Oregon at the current moment is their lack of pitching. Um, 
I did this a couple of days ago, so the stats really haven't changed, but 15 Oregon pitchers have thrown at least 10 innings this season, and 13 of them have walked at least 10 batters. That is the problem that we're dealing with. And with, with free base runners and walks or hit by pitches, whatever the case may be, that gives opportunities for the opposing team to score. Teams like Cal took advantage of that. Teams like Washington State took advantage of like that. And despite pitching very, very well against Oregon State, um, Oregon State still took advantage of it at some points. So you look at RJ Gordon, who has to go against Jerpy. That's a tough matchup for anybody in the country, but it's a tough matchup for a team who doesn't have an elite Friday night starter like they could have had in Adam Meyer, who is out for the season with an elbow injury. Gordon is certainly capable. He has his moments, as does Isaac Aon, but pitching is, is, is by far the weakness of this team. When it's clicking, um, it seems like they always flip-flop between which part of the team is clicking between offense and pitching. Um, but offense shouldn't be a problem going into this Oregon State series. Um, Oregon has probably the best offense in the, in the conference. Uh, one through nine is capable of, of hitting a double, hitting a home run, whatever the case may be, drawing a walk. Um, it's a very loaded front um, one to nine here at the University of Oregon. Um, that is without potentially without Anthony Hall, although he did DH on Tuesday. Hall was hurt on that inside the park grand slam that I had mentioned earlier. Um, Coach Wojciechowski said there's a chance that he may be playing the outfield come Friday night against Oregon State, but that is still yet to be seen because it's still early in the week. Um, as we, you know, there's there's three weeks left until the end of the season, and May 24th marks the start of the Pac-12 tournament. That's going to be another huge deciding factor on if Oregon can host a regional or not. Um, just because, similar to how we were talking about softball with Dylan and Jackson, about the Pac-12 is, is a bit of a bloodbath in terms of the quality of teams. Um, Oregon State, Oregon, UCLA, and Stanford are all ranked but even teams like Washington State can really put up a fight. Utah put up a fight. They beat Oregon State last weekend. Um, there's no shortage of talent in this conference. And the Pac-12 tournament, although only the top eight seeds go, it's going to be, it's going to, it, you know, it's probably going to be a bloodbath, bloodbath for someone. Uh, it's a double elimination tournament, and I'll, I'll kind of pose myself the same question as I did for for Dylan and Jackson of my confidence level. It's not as high as it once was. Um, I think prior to the Washington State series, I was doing some research on potential tickets to uh, Omaha or a super regional. Um, I think those have kind of gone by the wayside because the pitching staff at Oregon just might not cut it. Um, they have talent, but it's a lot of young talent. It's a lot of talent in the back end of their bullpen, which only helps when you're leading a game. It doesn't really help when you're coming from behind. Um, so it's 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 tough. If I were to give a one to ten, like Jackson did, I think it would be a six and a half, like a six point four, something like that. Where I, I'm confident in the offense. I think they can go toe to toe with anybody, except for UCLA, which I'll get to later. But I think they can go toe to toe with anybody in the conference in terms of scoring runs. Um, I don't have the specific stats in front of me, but uh, seven of the nine guys in the lineup are hitting over over 300. It was eight, but Jacob Walsh had an 0 for 4 game on Sunday and then dropped his average below 300 for the first time, basically all season long. Um, so they can go toe to toe. It doesn't matter as long as Anthony Hall is healthy. That it's the most prolific offense in the Pac-12. And again, it always comes back down to pitching, um, which is why posing the same question as to Jackson and Dylan, who would I not want to see in the Pac-12 tournament? If Oregon were matched up against UCLA in an elimination game for either of them, that would probably go UCLA's way just because of their pitching staff. Um, I think they have the best the best arms in the Pac-12. They may not have the, the top end as a, a Cooper Jerpy for Oregon State, but First starter to the back end of the bullpen, they have the best arms in, in the in the conference. And that would be a huge mismatch for Oregon. Obviously, their offense can put up numbers, but against UCLA, that's going to be a lot harder. You saw that in UCLA's sweep of Oregon earlier this season. Um, Oregon is a, is a home run happy team. They've broken the school record with you know 15 games left 
of how many home runs in a season with 57. They're now at uh, like 61, something like that. Um, they're capable, of course, as I mentioned, probably too many times right now. Um, but UCLA is absolutely the team you at least want to see. Um, but I, I think it's more important to, to focus on the Oregon State series at hand. Um, they have three games with them, and then they play UC San Diego, a midweek matchup uh, next Tuesday and Wednesday. And then they close out the season with uh, Arizona um, in or at home uh, against Arizona, which is going to be another extremely important game or important season ending uh, series, just because Arizona is another you know, top 25 team. Um, looks like I messed up. They have Gonzaga in there as well. Another out of conference important game where they're a top 15 team in the country as well. So the opportunity for Oregon to host potentially a super regional is still apparent. They would really honestly have to sweep Oregon State here this weekend. They'd have to beat Gonzaga and they'd have to beat Arizona as well. Um, it's there, but I think the state of the program is hoping to host a regional. And I don't think that's a bad thing to kind of finish this out because this has been quite the monologue for Oregon baseball. Um, Hosting a regional would be great for the University of Oregon and their baseball program because they have for so long been looked at as the little brother of the state, which makes sense since Oregon State has won, you know, a national championship in the last couple of years and won in 2007 as well. But this is another moment this season, this weekend in particular, to show that they can hold their own against a number two team in the country. Um, Oregon State was down last year as Oregon was up. They took five of seven away from them. They swept Oregon State at home. You know, that's what they should do when they are as good as a team as they were last year. They're going to be fighting from behind this weekend. Um, even when it's zero to zero, it still doesn't feel like it's, it's an equal matchup, uh, especially with the, the MLB talent that Oregon State has and has always had in the coaching. And that the fact that they're a baseball team that's built for college baseball with their speed, their doubles, their outfield defense, their pitching staff. Um, it's a great program there, but I think Oregon has, has turned a corner as a program as a whole under Wazikowski. Um, they recruit well. Uh, they develop players well. Uh, coach Jake Angier is one of the best pitching coaches in the conference. Jack Martyr is a great hitting coach. Brett Thomas, who's the director of analytics at the University of Oregon, I think has really had a huge impact on the program and how they view players and, and hitters and pitchers. Um, but this is, this is I, I would say this is the most important series of the season. And I think the season could go you know, one of two ways based off of how this, this three-game series goes. I think if they win two of three, it can provide a lot of confidence within the team and a lot of confidence going forward into that matchups between Arizona State, Gonzaga, and Arizona. Or they could be swept, which is not what everybody would like to hear, but I think it's a realistic possibility. Only because Tuesday night, I thought Oregon basically played a flawless game. They had seven or eight hits. They didn't score a single run. They had outstanding pitching, probably the best pitching performance of a full game that I've seen this season out of the Oregon bullpen. And they still lost. And so that's the problem. If they don't get that type of performance again out of the bullpen, does Oregon State jump on them? Because it came close at some points, but Oregon did a good job of holding them steady. If they were to be swept, I think it would be hard for Oregon to come back and host a regional. They would still make the postseason because of the work that they've done earlier in the season. But it wouldn't be great, I would say that. I, I think it would be a real testing point for the team to come up and get back into the season and get back into the next game with the same fire and energy that they had the game before, in the series before. Um, with that being said, the, the Oregon-Oregon State Series begins Friday at 7 p.m. Um, I will be making the trip up to Corvallis, up to Goss, so you'll be having plenty of content from there. Um, follow me on Twitter, at Jared underscore Mac 7. Um, I think that's all I got to plug for now. Keep reading us on Duck Territory. Um, Matt Prem is still currently on vacation, so it'll be Eric and I for another podcast sometime later this week. 
thank you to our executive producer, Eric Scopel, who's done an excellent job today of, of chatting with me while, while doing the podcast and making sure we do everything right. Uh, thanks again to Jackson Noggle and Dylan Conway for coming on. Uh, great to talk softball. Great to talk diamond sports. And last but not least, uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, hope to talk to you soon again. We'll see you guys on Friday. Peace.